When scouring the internet for evidence of doppelgangers, you'll not get very far before you stumble upon the tale of a French woman named Emily Sage. Hers is a tale of true mystery and intrigue that is widely touted as one of the best documented cases of the phenomena. Or, so the copy and pasted articles will continuously repeat again and again. But what of the truth? Where are these documents? It turns out that with some heavy digging, every story of Emily is in fact paraphrased and watered down from just one single source. A chapter in a book published in 1860, written by Robert Dale Owens, entitled Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World. There are, throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, several other works that comment on the story, but all derived from this same single publication. Robert Dale Owen was born in Glasgow, Scotland on the 7th of November in 1801. He was the eldest surviving son of eight children born to Anne Dale and Robert Owen, a wealthy textiles factory owner turned philanthropist who dedicated his latter years to social reform. Interested in the concept of experimental utopian communities, he joined his family and emigrated to the United States, becoming a US citizen in 1825, where he helped to manage a socialist community in Indiana, whilst his father continued his philanthropic work back in the United Kingdom. In 1830, he became the leader of the Working Men's Party in New York City and actively opposed slavery. In the mid-1830s, he served in the Indiana House of Representatives, leading the line to secure both women's rights and a system of free school education. In 1842, he was elected as a Democrat in the US House of Representatives and served in Congress until 1847. After his defeat for re-election in 1848, however, he returned to public service and served as a state legislator in Indiana throughout the 1850s. By the late 1850s, his politics took something of a swerve, and like his father, he had converted to spiritualism. His first publication on the subject was that which included a tale of Emily Sage, Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World. Emily Sage was born in Dijon in France in 1813. The following is her story as originally written by Dale Owen in 1860 in its entirety. Why a Livonian school teacher lost her situation, habitual apparition of a living person. There existed in the year 1845 and is still continued in Livonia about 36 miles from Riga and a mile and a half from the small town of Volmar an institution of high repute for the education of young ladies, entitled the Pensionat of Neuvelk. It is under the superintendence of Moravian directors, of whom the principal, at the time of the occurrences about to be related, was named Buck. There were, in that year, 42 young ladies residing there as boarders, chiefly daughters of noble Livonian families. Among them, Mademoiselle Julie, second daughter of the Baron de Gordon Stube, then 13 years of age. In this institution, one of the female teachers at that time was Mademoiselle Emily Sage, a French lady from Dijon. She was of the northern type, a blonde with very fair complexion, light blue eyes, chestnut hair, slightly above the middle size and of slender figure. In character, she was amiable and quiet and good-tempered, not at all given to anger or impatience, but of an anxious disposition, and as to her physical temperament, somewhat nervously excitable. Her health was usually good, and during the year and a half that she lived as teacher at Neuvelk, she had but one or two slight indispositions. She was intelligent and accomplished, and the directors during the entire period of her stay were perfectly satisfied with her conduct, her industry and her requirements. She was at that time 32 years of age. A few weeks after Mademoiselle Sage first arrived, singular reports began to circulate among the pupils. When some casual inquiry happened to be made as to where she was, one young lady would reply that she had seen her in such and such a room, whereupon another would say, Oh no, she can't be there, for I've just met her on the stairway, or perhaps in some distant corridor. 
At first they naturally supposed it was a mere mistake, but as the same thing recurred again and again, they began to think it very odd, and finally spoke to the other governesses about it. Whether the teachers at the time could have furnished an explanation or not, they gave none. They merely told the young ladies it was all fancy and nonsense and bade them pay no attention to it. But after a time, things much more extraordinary and which could not be set down to imagination or mistake began to occur. One day the governess was giving a lesson to a class of 13 of whom Mademoiselle de Gordenstube was one and was demonstrating, with eagerness, some proposition to illustrate which she had occasion to write with chalk on a blackboard. While she was doing so and the young ladies were looking at her, to their consternation, they suddenly saw two Mademoiselle Sarges, the one by the side of the other. They were exactly alike and they used the same gestures, only that the real person held a bit of chalk in her hand and did actually write, while the double had no chalk and only imitated the motion. This incident naturally caused a great sensation in the establishment. It was ascertained on inquiry that every one of the 13 young ladies in the class had seen the second figure and that they had all agreed in their description of its appearance and of its motions. Soon after, one of the pupils, a Mademoiselle Antoni de Vrangel, having obtained permission with some others to attend a fée champêtre in the neighbourhood and being engaged in completing her toilet, Mademoiselle Sarget had good-naturedly volunteered her aid and was hooking her dress behind. The young lady, happening to turn around and to look in an adjacent mirror, perceived two Mademoiselle Sarges hooking her dress. The sudden apparition produced so much effect upon her that she fainted. Months passed by and similar phenomena were still repeated. Sometimes at dinner, the double appeared standing behind the teacher's chair and imitating her motions as she ate, only that its hands held no knife and fork and that there was no appearance of food. The figure alone was repeated. All the pupils and the servants waiting on the table witnessed this. It was only occasionally, however, that the double appeared to imitate the motions of the real person. Sometimes when the latter rose from a chair, the figure would appear seated on it. On one occasion, Mademoiselle Sarget being confirmed to bed with an attack of influenza, the young lady already mentioned, Mademoiselle de Vrangel was sitting by her bedside reading to her. Suddenly the governess became stiff and pale, and seeming as if about to faint, the young lady, alarmed, asked if she was worse. She replied that she was not, but in a very feeble and languid voice. A few seconds afterwards, Mademoiselle de Vrangel happened to look around and saw quite distinctly the figure of the governess walking up and down the apartment. This time the young lady had sufficient self-control to remain quiet, and even to make no remarks to the patient. Soon afterwards, she came downstairs looking very pale and related what she had witnessed. But the most remarkable example of this seeming independent action of the two figures happened in this wise. One day, all of the young ladies of the institution, to the number of 42, were assembled in the same room, engaged in embroidery. It was a spacious hall on the first floor of the principal building and had four large windows, or rather glass doors, for they opened to the floor, giving entrance to a garden of some extent in front of the house. There was a long table in the centre of the room, and here it was that the various classes were wont to unite for needlework or similar occupation. On this occasion, the young ladies were all seated at the table in question, whence they could readily see what passed in the garden and while engaged at their work, they had noticed Mademoiselle Sarge there, not far from the house, gathering flowers, of which she was very fond. At the head of the table, seated in an armchair, of green Morocco, my informant says, she still distinctly recollects that it was, sat another teacher in charge of the pupils. After a time, this lady had occasion to leave the room, and the armchair was left vacant. It remained so, however, for a short time only, for of a sudden there appeared, seated in it, the figure of Mademoiselle Sarge. The young ladies immediately looked into the garden, and there she still was, engaged as before. Only they remarked that she moved very slowly and languidly, as a drowsy or exhausted person might. Again they looked at the armchair, and there she sat, silent and without motion, but to the sight so palpably real that, 
had they not seen her outside in the garden, and had they not known that she appeared in the chair without having walked into the room, they would all have supposed that it was the lady herself. As it was, being quite certain that it was not a real person, and having become, to a certain extent, familiar with this strange phenomenon, two of the boldest approached and tried to touch the figure. They averred that they did feel a slight resistance, which they likened to that which a fabric of fine muslin or crepe would offer to the touch. One of the two then passed close in front of the armchair and actually threw a portion of the figure. The appearance, however, remained after she had done so, for some time longer, still seated as before. At last it gradually disappeared, and then it was observed that Mademoiselle Sarge resumed with all her usual activity, her task of flower gathering. Every one of the 42 pupils saw the same figure in the same way. Some of the young ladies afterward asked Mademoiselle Sarge if there was anything peculiar in her feelings on this occasion. She replied that she recollected this only, that, happening to look up and perceiving the teacher's armchair to be vacant, she had thought to herself, I wish she had not gone away. These girls would be sure to be idling their time and get into some mischief. This phenomena continued under various modifications throughout the whole time that Mademoiselle Sarge retained her situation at Neuvelk. That is, throughout a portion of the years 1845 and 1846 and in all for about a year and a half, at intervals, however, sometimes intermitting for a week, sometimes for several weeks at a time. It seemed chiefly to present itself on occasions when the lady was very earnest or eager in what she was about. It was uniformly remarked that the more distinct and material to the sight the double was, the more stiff and languid was the living person, and in proportion, as the double faded, did the real individual resume her powers. She herself, however, was totally unconscious of the phenomena. She had first become aware of it only from the reports of others, and she usually detected it by the looks of the persons present. She never herself saw the appearance, nor seemed to notice the species of rigid apathy which crept over her at the times it was seen by others. During the 18 months throughout which my informant had an opportunity of witnessing this phenomena and of hearing it through others, No example came to her knowledge of the appearance of the figure at any considerable distance, as of several miles from the real person. Sometimes it appeared, but not far off, during their walks in the neighbourhood. More frequently, however, within doors. Every servant in the house had seen it. It was, apparently, perceptible to all persons without distinction of age or sex. It will be readily supposed that so extraordinary a phenomena could not continue to show itself for more than a year in such an institution without injury to its prosperity. In point of fact, as soon as it was completely proved by the double appearance of Mademoiselle Sarge before the class and afterward before the whole school that there was no imagination in the case, the matter began to reach the ears of the parents. Some of the more timid among the girls also became much excited and evinced great alarm whenever they happened to witness so strange and inexplicable a thing. The natural result was that their parents began to scruple about leaving them under such an influence. One after another, as they went home for the holidays, they failed to return, and though the true reason was not assigned to the directors, they knew it well. Being strictly upright and conscientious men, however, and very unwilling that a well-conducted, diligent and competent teacher should lose her position on account of a peculiarity that was entirely beyond her control, a misfortune, not a fault, they persevered in retaining her until at the end of 18 months the number of pupils had decreased from 42 to 12. It then became apparent that either the teacher or the institution must be sacrificed and with much reluctance and many expressions of regret on the part of those to whom her amiable qualities had endeared her, Mademoiselle Sarge was dismissed. The poor girl was in despair. Mademoiselle de Gudenstuber heard her exclaim soon after the decision reached her, Ah, the nineteenth time. It is very, very hard to bear. When asked what she meant by such an exclamation, she reluctantly confessed that previous to her engagement at Neuvelk, She had been teacher in 18 different schools, having entered the first when only 16 years of age, and that, on account of the strange and alarming phenomena 
which attached to her she had lost after a comparatively brief sojourn, one situation after another. As, however, her employers were in every other respect well satisfied with her, she obtained in each case favourable testimonies as to her conduct and abilities. Dependent entirely on her labour for support, the poor girl had been compelled to avail herself of these in search of a livelihood in places where the cause of her dismissal was not known. Even though she felt assured from experience that a few months could not fail again to disclose it. After she left Neuvelk, she went to live for a time in the neighbourhood with a sister-in-law who had several quiet young children. Thither, the peculiarity pursued her. Mademoiselle de Gordenstuber, going to see her there, learned that the children of three or four years of age all knew of it, being in the habit of saying that they saw two Aunt Emilies. Subsequently, she set out for the interior of Russia, and Mademoiselle de Gordenstuber lost sight of her entirely. That lady was not able to inform me whether the phenomena had shown itself during Mademoiselle Sarge's infancy or previous to her 16th year, nor whether, in the case of any of her family or of any of her ancestors, a similar peculiarity had appeared. I had the above narrative from Mademoiselle de Gordenstuber herself, and she kindly gave me permission to publish it with every particular of name, place and date. She remained as pupil at Neuvelk during the whole time that Mademoiselle Sarge was teacher there. No one, therefore, could have had a better opportunity of observing the case in all its details. It is, it has to be said, a fascinating and unsettling story. Just how much of it is confirmed as truth or verifiable, however, as the sole source and based purely from eyewitness testimony, one cannot take it at face value without a little investigation. To dig into the truth of this story, one of the first steps we need to take is to confirm whether or not Emily Sage did in fact exist in history. Trawling birth and death registers, we can find a birth certificate in 1813 of one Octavie Sage, a girl born in Dijon in the correct year and with the correct family name, but an entirely different Christian name. It could well be possible that they are one and the same, however, as Octavie was an illegitimate child and at the time it was common to change one's name in adulthood in order to cast off the suspicion and prejudices associated with such a birth. There is also always the possibility that with over 30 years passing between the events and her relaying the story to Dale Owen, time simply eroded the memory of the Baroness and she mistakenly named the teacher as Emily entirely innocently. There is at least historical evidence that the family name Sarge did live in Dijon in the correct period. And for someone with so many jobs, however, there are no other documents, no records of employment and no death certificate. The paper trail runs entirely cold. In a serialised publication released in 1907 named The Word, a sort of Edwardian version of the Fatayan Times, Edward Herman writes a piece entitled The Astral Plane in which he comments that Alexander Askakov, a Russian journalist and writer who examined the case and included it in his book Animismus et Spiritsmus, published in 1890, actually took photos of Emily's apparition. Though this appears to have been a mistranslation of the original text, as Herman was in fact stating that the case of Emily Sage could be cleared up if photographic evidence was to be taken. And then it goes on to comment about an entirely different case where photographic evidence was apparently obtained. Another publication, The Mysteries of Hypnosis, published in 1902, authored by Georges Dubois, it was written that the self-same Alexander Aksakov obtained the details firsthand from several of the pupils at the school and received permission to publish the names of his informants. Once again though, Aksakov failed to live up to the hype and there is no mention of him doing this nor publishing any names at all. He, like all others, recounts the story from Robert Dale Owen. The school of Neuvelk is a different story. The task of uncovering any historical evidence for the establishment is made difficult by the medley of languages used at the time that name places with various different names. This is made all the more complicated due to Robert Dale Owen's fast and loose way with figures. Volmar is the modern day town of Valmiera in Latvia and is slightly more than 36 miles from Riga that Dale Owen stated. In reality, 
Falmiera lies 82 miles northeast of Riga. Neuvelk is generally translated into modern day Malbazi, however, if it is the town he talks about in his account of Emily Sage, it lies not one and a half miles from Falmar at all, rather 82 miles east, and there are no records of the school in that town. It appears that if the school did exist, it could well be in another town altogether and could itself possibly be documented under another name entirely. Dale Owens does write about the school that it still exists having gradually recovered its standing after Mademoiselle Sarge left it and corroborative evidence can be obtained by addressing its directors. However, once again we are left with only the word of the original writer. He makes no attempt to extrapolate on this point nor to clue the reader in on whether or not he did approach the directors or is rather stating that it may be possible to do so if one was so inclined. The only other pupil named in the story, Antoni von Rangel, is also elusive. The family von Rangel did exist in the correct time period and in the correct location, however no record of an Antoni can be found. One Emily von Rangel was found, with Antony as her third given name, however she would have been born just three years before the event took place. Though with Antony being included in her given names, this does suggest that somewhere in her family line an Antony could have well existed. So what about Guldenstuber, a witness who was claimed to be so venerable and of high character? In a book titled 19th Century Miracles, or Spirits in Their Work in Every Country of the Earth, a Complete Compendium, written by Emma Harding Britton and published in 1884, the Baron and his sister are described. The Baron is a nobleman of well-known status and good fortune. His wife is a firm believer, but is not a medium, while his sister, said to be very clever and amiable, but the most weird, unearthly and elfin looking little creature imaginable, shares her brother's gifts and even surpasses them in this line. Which is quite impressive for the Baroness, as the same book claims that the Baron is able to heal the sick by animal magnetism. So as it turns out, the Baroness was the member of the both high society and the spirit circle in France, along with her brother who led the group. The pair were, in fact, fairly famous spirit mediums for their time, and the Baron could do much more than simply healing the sick. He is described as a psychic of great power, and was able to obtain evidence of psychography or spirit writing without the aid of a pencil and in the cold light of day. One account of this is documented in a paper published by M. A. Oxen in 1878 titled Psychography a treatise on one of the objective forms of psychic or spiritual phenomena, and it describes him as such. Baron Guldenstuber seems to have been able to dispense with the usual conditions under which writing is obtained. A closed room with magnetically charged atmosphere, subdued light and a formal gathering of persons, from or through whom the necessary force is evolved. He obtained his writings anywhere and at any time. The circle worked in places as grand as the Louvre and Versailles. One of his experiments in Versailles is detailed and told of proceeding as such. After twelve days, during which no mark was made on the paper, there appeared on it certain mysterious characters, and during that day ten separate experiments gave successful results. The box was then left open and watched, and writing was seen to grow upon the paper without the use of the pencil. From that time, he abandoned the use of the pencil altogether and obtained his vast number of psychographs by the simple process of putting blank paper on the table of his room or in public buildings or on the pedestal of ancient statues or on tombstones in churches and cemeteries. It apparently mattered little where the paper was placed and it is more than probable that the Baron, by exercise of his will, could have obtained any given name in any given place. If this held any truth, then there is no doubt at all that the Baron was indeed a psychic of great power, for he seemed to hold abilities which have not been documented before nor since outside of the realm of fantasy. And who was one of the key members of their circle who travelled to France to witness such events? That would be one Robert Dale Owen, the man who wrote and published the account of Emily Sage from the Baroness that had spawned a tale lasting for over 150 years. 
For a case that is supposedly well documented, one has to ask. If Emily Sarge's mysterious ghostly doppelganger was witnessed by 42 young girls of a boarding school, why was it only ever retold by one? It appears more and more likely the further we dig that the case of Emily Sarge was a tall tale whisked up by a 19th century spiritualist spoken to a man who was a close friend and who was, at best, heavily biased by his own belief in spiritualism. Published in an old book with an authoritative name, in modern times it has spawned a new lease of life by any number of internet-based bloggers, podcasters and YouTubers who all make the same old claim that it is well documented. The truth, however, seems that whilst it's a great story, it all appears to be built upon very frail foundations indeed. Is there any chance the phenomena could be real, or that the events of Neuvelt could be true? In the end, we are no closer to uncovering any half evidence on either side. However, the curious tale of Emily Sage is not the only case of doppelgangers in history. The term doppelganger is relatively modern in origin. However, the concept of a spirit double has existed throughout history and across the world. In ancient Egypt, the Ka shared many of the same characteristics. In Norse mythology, Farduja too would appear to play out the actions of its originator in advance. In Cornish, Welsh and Norman folklore, the Anko, or the traditional personification of death complete with scythe and cloak, can be seen as a version of the modern doppelganger. In fiction, the doppelganger has been used as both a tool to frighten readers and explores philosophies involving the human condition, and stretch from the ancient Greeks to Dostoevsky, from Edgar Allan Poe to films like Fight Club and The Double. Depicted as evil twins, foreshadowed directly to doings of the future, metaphorical representations of human duality, and simple apparitions with no apparent intellectual qualities, the tales cover a broad spectrum. Even the most famous and powerful have been known to have had apparitions of themselves appear, as in the case of Abraham Lincoln. In the book Washington in Lincoln's Time, published in 1895, the author Noah Brooks recounts a story as told directly to him by Lincoln himself. It was just after my election in 1860, when the news had been coming in thick and fast all day and there had been a great hurrah boys, so that I was well tired out and went home to rest, throwing myself down on a lounge in my chamber. Opposite where I lay was a bureau with a swinging glass upon it, and looking in that glass, I saw myself reflected nearly at full length. But my face, I noticed, had two separate and distinct images, the tip of the nose of about three inches from the tip of the other. I was a little bothered, perhaps startled, and got up and looked in the glass, but the illusion vanished. On lying down again, I saw it a second time, plainer if possible than before, and then I noticed that one of the faces was a little paler, say five shades, than the other. I got up and the thing melted away, and I went off and in the excitement of the hour forgot all about it. Nearly, but not quite, for the thing would once in a while come up and give me a little pang as if something uncomfortable had happened. When I went home again that night I told my wife about it, and a few days afterwards I made the experiment again when, sure enough, the thing came back again, but I never succeeded in bringing the ghost back after that. Though I once tried very industriously to show it to my wife, who was somewhat worried about it. She thought it was a sign that I was to be elected to a second term of office, and that the paleness of one of the faces was an omen that I should not see the claim to have survived through the last term. Queen Elizabeth I, too, was said to have seen her own doppelganger, whilst lying on her deathbed, as well as the poet Percy Shelley, husband of the writer of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, who claimed to have seen his own on several occasions. Catherine the Great ordered her own doppelganger shot by the guards when she first saw a ghostly visitor of herself sitting on her throne, ordering her armed guard to shoot the imposter. So how can we explain all these hundreds of cases in history? In the realm of the paranormal, the idea of bilocation, whereby one projects an image of their physical body to a different location, is as old as the doppelganger itself, though there stands no physical evidence or proof of such an ability. The idea that one's soul or spirit can leave the body at will is again suggested, though once again it holds no evidence or factual basis. If found any paranormal phenomena, 
we can turn to science and psychology to try and explain away such visions. Hallucinations due to stress or underlying conditions such as epilepsy and schizophrenia have all been marked for serious consideration when looking to find answers in medical conditions and chime back to the concept of hotoscopy, a possible symptom of all of the above conditions, in which the vision or hallucination of one's own body appears outside of the self. However, these explanations do not explain or even begin to explain so many of the historical cases of doppelgangers. What of the case of Emily Sage for a start, where the entire class saw her double? You could possibly chalk it up to a collective hallucination, or in an isolated and contained environment such as the school, it could be said that collective suggestion is a good explanation. Clearly, however, there is something deeper going on here than rare symptoms of psychological problems. If we were to discount cases where these are likely explanations, they would surely make up only a small minority. Why is it that the concept has fascinated in folklore and literature for so many years? And what is it about the tale of Emily Sage that both instills fear and intrigue at once? It could be suggested that the very concept of a spiritual vision of oneself represents a whole host of philosophical explanations. From the concepts of the other as a form of human duality and manifestation of a person's unconscious, undesirable or desirable qualities. In the undesirable, we are transposing our own image of ourselves onto an outside other. In simple terms, we are placing them at arm's length or distancing ourselves from them due to a fear that if we were to accept them as qualities within ourselves, society might judge us poorly. In the case of the desirable qualities, the other acts as a form of that which we wish for but do not believe ourselves capable of achieving. These psychological and philosophical arguments for our fascination with doppelgangers run incredibly deep, but on the surface, our fear and intrigue of an identical self, either in the spiritual or physical form, represent questions on self-identity such as who am I, what is my life about and what could I be, the answers of which could both be aspirational and terrifying depending on the outlook. It is a narrative which helps us to explore the nature of our own self-identity. Or, if we were to cast all of the psychological baggage aside, the fear of the doppelganger could just be our fear of what Freud called the uncanny, something that which is both familiar and strange at the same time. When we see a familiar object removed from the original, it promotes an anxiety and fear within ourselves. Seeing a spirit double of ourselves or of another promotes the consideration of the self and of the soul. With the idea of the soul tied to death as it is, our primal fears are peaked. And we should probably leave these ideas here for the time being, as these concepts could probably make for an entire podcast series alone. However, the basic ideas help to explain why we are both fascinated and fearful of such a phenomena, and perhaps why the story of Emily Sage has preserved, despite apparent lack of hard evidence, for such a long period of time. In the end, it seems highly unlikely that Emily Sage ever existed. We have nothing but flimsy evidence based on a single dated oral account from a 19th century medium who claimed, among other things, to be able to heal the sick and obtain spirit writing. Whilst there is some evidence of a family Sage who lived in Dijon at the supposed time of her birth, there is no other solid documentation to confirm her existence of either her or the school she taught at. But what of the numerous other cases of doppelgangers? It seems that scientific explanations only barely cover the concept and do not answer for the hundreds of cases documented throughout history. The fact that they have existed throughout history, however, and across cultures, speaks to a much deeper reasoning for their existence, at least in the imagination. To untangle this question, however, we are led down deep rabbit holes, where we must tackle profound questions on self-identity and what it exactly means for us to be who we are.